All right, hi everyone back home and viewers. Welcome to season two of the Salt City Index, and I'm super excited to have our first guest. But before I go into great detail about who he was, when I first encountered him, he definitely was very striking to me. And I have, you know, a law enforcement background. I said to myself, this guy has to be like a military leader because of his dominance of who he was. And lo and behold, it was true. So I would love nothing more to introduce today, New York State Assemblyman John Lamondes. Hi. Hi, Hi, thank you for having me. It's a, it's uh, wonderful to be here. Well, I appreciate it. You know what I mean? It's awesome. You know, for people tuning in for season two for the Salt City Index, we go around Onondaga County in the city of Syracuse, and we, infl and we interview influencers of the area. Um, and of course, being a state assemblyman, I would call you an influencer for sure, and thank you for being on our show. But some of us may have no idea who you are or what your background is, so if you can maybe just let like the voters or the constituents back home just get a general idea or snapshot of who you are. Sure. Easy enough. Uh, born and raised in Liverpool, graduated from high school in uh, 1983 from Liverpool. I'm 59 years old, Penn State graduate in agricultural science. Then I spent 27 years in the Army, retiring at the, at the rank of uh, full colonel. Uh, that included service in uh, both Iraq and Afghanistan. And I worked in industry for five years, so I bring I bring a different perspective uh, forward. I bring both uh, tactical military experience, program management in the latter part of my career, lots of fiscal experience uh, in the government, as well as uh, program management and leadership in the high tech uh, world, where I worked on uh, developing naval and Marine Corps radar systems, and then uh, simultaneously. I'm um, a small business owner here locally and own uh, my own uh, uh, family farm, which we uh, continue to work and started with nothing. And uh, it's a pretty big operation now. So uh, second term in the assembly, this would be the third. I'm looking forward to representing people uh, uh, of this assembly district, all 140,000 of them, regardless of, of where they are on the spectrum. And I think I've shown that apolitical nature uh, to my representation of them over the last four years, and will continue to do so. I mean, that's very impressive. I mean, uh, you know, the having that military back. First of all, thank you for your service. You know, you're welcome. Um, you know, I was a New York City police officer. I'm not even going to go into like my uh, resume because it doesn't really compare to yours. You know, but being a colonel definitely gives you a very unique you know perspective uh when it comes to like you know leadership so one of the things that you mentioned because for the viewers back home this is your second term as in you've been you ran you you know you held it more than once and you're currently doing the job so like how does having your military background does that have any uh effect in your policy or you in the new york state assembly yeah absolutely my background uh uh you know helps me be apolitical. It helps me understand everything uh, from all perspectives uh, in a better way than somebody that has no experience at all. And so uh, what, what I mean by that is a lot of people run for office for all the wrong reasons. They run for office because it's their varsity sport. Politics is nothing more than a varsity sport to that. And that is the wrong reason. I am running. I have run. Uh, because of distinct things that I saw that I didn't like, things going in the wrong direction. And as I always said to anybody that ever came into my office in any position with a complaint, my first question is, I'll listen to your complaint as long as you've thought through potential courses of action to fix it. Don't come throw the complaint on me without having exercised enough discipline to think through, well, how do we solve this problem? Anybody can throw the complaint. Solving it is the next step. And it's it. Uh, no matter what vocation you're in, that if you if you don't take the second step there and actually commit yourself to the personal discipline necessary to solve a problem, no matter how simple or difficult it might be, you're never going to solve it. And uh, that's one of the things that that I bring forward is uh, being someone that's never quit anything in his life. Uh, I, I I don't intend. To quit, uh, to quit this, not in the near term, because there's a direct need for people uh, like myself, like you, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, understand from a, uh, from a genuine perspective of having put your life on the line. You know, I say, you know, have you ever had skin in the game? People that, right. that, throw, that throw 
all the hand grenades at everything you're not doing. You know, have you, have you, have, how do you judge somebody's level of commitment? I'll tell you how you do it. You, you ask them, have you ever had skin in the game? And that's a, that's a differentiator. And so people that have understand that, uh, to a much greater extent than your varsity athletes. And I mean that in a, in a, um, sarcastic way. I've met, you know, you've met them too. There are a lot of varsity political athletes running around out there that uh, have run for office for all of the wrong reasons, and some of them just are successful in getting elected. Uh, but again, when 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 politics is the game, mm-hmm. and you have to check that motive, and I think that makes that makes that person less effective. That's a lot, a lot of truth there. You know, it's um, what I've noticed at least across the board since like this is the second season. But people are running just for their own personal gain, and has and they've lost touch of being like the representative of the people. As in, like, you're in the New York State Assembly representing our voice. And as a collective, we're saying, like, but the elected official who got in office is, it's about my friends, you know, and my personal goals, and, and el- or even being vindictive, unfortunately. You know what I mean? So, but on, on a positive note, I know that you have that opposite approach, which is a great, you know, breath for stretch air. But you also work in the tech industry, which is, you know, unique, because I had a lot of buddies, you know, who got out. You know, you know, military, and then they went into NYPD. You know, then they were like, "Well, why did you go in the NYPD right after military?" Because it was like, uh, "I'm used to doing the hoorah thing." You yep. know, I'm not a suit and tie type of guy. <laughs> you know, but you were able to do that to make that transition. So, like, does that give you like a different perspective, or like, what's your thought of that? Just curious. It gives me a much broader perspective, and I think in jobs like this, the broader you can be, as long as it's legitimate experience the better off you can serve people. The more easily you can connect to people and the problems and challenges that they're having. You know, uh, as you know, one of our greatest challenges in New York State right now is uh, the protection of law enforcement, giving them the tools that they need, you know, reversing all of these horrendous bail reform policies, which the left claims as something uh, wonderful. Uh, However, they've eliminated accountability from our society and when you eliminate accountability you eliminate it for everyone and then what do you have you you've just got a mess on your hands and so um you know coming from that that background in the military where uh you know not only is accountability expected um it's driven too and uh it it makes a huge difference in the outcomes that you pursue at all levels, when everybody understands that they're accountable for their piece of the pie, no matter what, from top to bottom. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's, <laughs> look, the, uh, the other day I saw a bunch of teenagers just robbing a, a Dollar General, just play, mm-hmm. just walking in, grabbing stuff, and leaving. And like, there's no accountability, you know, anymore. Like right. things are, you know, getting out of control. But you are, you know, being strong and you know, being positive, you know, for backing law enforcement. I appreciate it. So thank you. You know what I mean? Because it's definitely needed. Absolutely. But you also have, you're very well rounded as well. I mean, because like you're an entrepreneur as well. So like you, like, I mean, I didn't start a farm. I don't even know how they, you know, let's take on like that enterprise. That's not an easy step. But like, well, what made you decide, like, I want to be a farmer of all things? So, uh, of all, well, my undergraduate degree is in agricultural science. The, the army got in the way for 27 years. And I say that jokingly. Uh, uh, my career was tough, as is everyone's. And I had uh, the first two years of my career were in a peacetime army. The next 25, we were at war, and we still are at war. Uh, as a kid, I worked on three different farms. That kind of set the seed that I, I like this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I went to uh, uh, I went to college. That set the that set the um, planted the seed for the degree in agriculture and uh, technical. Uh, technical degree in science there and that uh that served me well in the military you know the military drew on that some of the jobs that i had um required that technical background and then um so that was always there that was something i was always going to do i just didn't know exactly what and i didn't know exactly when so entrepreneurially um that this helps serve helps me serve the people of the state and the district uh, through my role in the uh, Economic Development Committee. You know, my other assignments are agriculture, environmental conservation, banks, and uh, corporations. And so all of those fit together very, very nicely. 
Right. And uh, uh, um, I am hoping that uh, in the next session here, the Republican caucus will have more seats and, and mm-hmm. will be able to uh, put forward some business-friendly regulation or deregulation, I mean, excuse me, to make it easier for business to participate in economic activity here, which the lack of that has been one of the most important uh, drivers of out-migration. As you know, our state uh, has the highest, we've been the highest out-migrating state three consecutive years in a row. We have to turn this around. And we turn this around by being positive, by creating an environment for business to be successful. And that takes people that understand business. You know, I just said in a hearing this week, amazed at uh, at my colleagues on the left, all of a sudden talking about being business friendly. I, and I thought there couldn't be a coincidence here with the election loom, right? Yeah, no, it's nothing at all. Nothing of course. At all. And uh, this is, these are words that I've never heard from the left in four years. And all of a sudden, they've woken up and they care about public safety. They care about police officers. And they care about economic, legitimate economic activity and business development and making it easier for, for business to us uh, to succeed. Because they know their policies have driven people uh, away, driven businesses away, driven billions of dollars away out of our economy. And uh, that's not good for, for anybody. No, not at all. I mean, like, uh, I'm an entrepreneur as well. Like, I've had a couple of businesses internationally and, you know, locally as well. And uh, um, I even have, like, a new venture I'm working on. And I immediately said to myself, I'm going to make my headquarters outside of Bonondaga County. Like, I'm just going to go incorporate, like, in Nevada, you know, because it's easier uh, because right. of all the upfront benefits. But I have seen, and I'm <laughs> grateful, in, in, at least in Onondaga County for sure, um, this revivement of economic development to actually say, no, right. we're, we are a hub. We are a thriving, you know, location and keep yeah. your business here. So I did incorporate, uh, you know, here, here in Syracuse, um, which is good. Of course, I mean, helping people get started is not easy because like everyone knows that, well, not everyone knows, but like it's financial hurdles really is a divide for a lot of people because there's like a, right. a glass ceiling. It's like, I want to start a business. I want to be successful, but how do I do it? How do I get started? Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn. So you ever hear like the book Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? I yeah. didn't have a rich dad. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, grateful I have a dad. Thank God. You know what I mean? But when it came to like financial things, I'm like, I have to make it out on my own. So having like right. you step in from like on an assembly level, you know what I mean? To make sure that there's legislation in place to, uh, to help people like myself. That's fantastic. But is there anything else that you would want to see, uh, I guess, different from this next term, you know, that God be willing that you get into, um, that you want to finish through in this economic development size, like you, something you might've started or, you know, kind of like in the pipeline that you're looking to drive through. Um, there are a lot of things So uh, we could spend an hour or so just on this. Um, one of the, one of the most important things is, uh, driving the cost down for business owners. And I'll use a specific example just to give context. I sent a letter to the governor uh, about the asylum fee that the federal government has placed on uh, on businesses that use H-2A migrant laborers. And so this, uh, for small businesses using less than five migrant laborers, this fee went from 400 some odd dollars a year to over a thousand this year, and and there you can't not pay it, and it's in it. That's how that's how New York is crushing businesses. And when you look at the stats of small businesses, are they starting or are they stopping? Over time, we are losing small businesses. When you listen to the governor stand up, she gives this rosy story about all of this economic activity, but she is completely immune to the to the actual statistics of what's happening, and that what's happening is. We are losing businesses, and we are losing businesses because of all of these policies that are driving people away. And so um, I want to make sure that uh, our governor is cognizant of these things, which is why I sent a letter which had nearly the entire uh, Republican caucus as signatories on it saying, really, you're going to throw another $1,000 fine on small businesses to pay to, to pay." for the asylum fees for illegal aliens? Are you kidding me? And so these are the things that are so only somebody that doesn't, what 
that doesn't understand business, that's never been in a business, that's never made payroll. These are the things that 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 uh, people like that do because they don't understand what it takes. They hear LLC, C Corp, and S Corp, and they think McDonald's, Microsoft. They don't understand that it is guys like you and me with with yeah. with kids that we're trying to, you know, come up with the money for them to play baseball, and so um, yes, right. And and uh, you know what I said in this economic development hearing this week was, I, and I asked some of the some of the business leaders that were testifying, would you get behind a, an initiative that I will lead that will require? state assembly members and senate members to take a refresher and an introduction about business and so i said think about it you mandate every aspect of human uh behavior through all of the hr courses that we have to take we got to take uh courses on on uh how to be civil we have to take sources courses on on race we have to take DEI courses. We have to do all of these HR requirements. Yet, yet we're passing laws that are closing businesses, and there's no requirement for the people making these laws to have any understanding of what a business is. That's wild. That's my cool. colleagues on the left, by the way, just so everybody that listens understands, my colleagues on the left were not a fan of this idea. They didn't want anything to do with it. Oh, imagine that. Yeah, imagine that. I mean, it's. What what I see all the time is that sometimes it's more of like a uh, popularity race, and the most qualified individual is getting into into office. It's right, not a person that's right for the job. You know, I look at like someone who's running for public office is like it's a long end month, you know, job application. Right. You know, where you're going through like different interview phases and you know going through the process. But I would love to see the best qualified individual elected. I feel you definitely are. Uh, Thank you. Have terms, you know what I mean, and you definitely you know stand up. So like. But, you know, talking about economic development and what about like education or like empowering like the workforce, you know, for like the next upcoming, you know, for like upstate, do you have any plans for that or is that in your forefront or your periphery at this point? So uh, there are a couple things. Um, one, one of the best things that we did in a bipartisan manner in the last session was the, uh, the SAFE Act to stop the exploitation feeds uh, to children from uh, social media. So. You know, that's step one. Enforcing it is going to be step two, but actually getting the the, uh, the legislation in place was was critical. That was a win for everyone. So so my point here is a bipartisan work is necessary and you have to realize that. And I have you know, already demonstrated that uh, that I'm willing to do that and can do that. Uh, what I one of the things I'd like to see is. Uh, fewer Republican bills held in committee. You know what what the what the left does is yeah. they held back 151 Republican bills from going through committee this session, and in 2023 20, uh, they held back 153. And so so for folks listening, what that means is when a bill comes forward with a Republican name on it, no matter how much it would help our community and state and people and towns and villages and municipalities. They automatically put it in 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 the back and say, "So sorry, we're not letting this go forward." Um, and so, one of the bills that uh, that was held, which I hope uh, this is another bipartisan. This is uh, Mr. Benedetto and myself, our co-sponsors on it. It's uh, a CTE bill, and so what it would do is uh, chronic uh, uh, traumatic encephalopathy. It would you know caused from there are lots of lots of causes, but the biggest one is is uh, um, youth football before the eighth grade, and so this would change the rules for it. Doesn't stop football, which is you know right. some critics are saying you know, and I'm a lifelong athlete, so I am not trying. I, I recognize how important athletics are. You know, I just did. Uh, I just recognized uh, Coach's Day, uh, October sixth. Yeah. So. So the recognition of the importance of athletics is not what this bill is attempting to do. What this bill is attempting to do is to reduce the number of concussions in our youth and reduce the severity of them. And so, believe it or not, though, uh, last year in committee, this drew fire all over the place. And they're like, look, this is a community action bill. This helps all of our children. We are not trying to stop 
the sport of football or anything else. I mean, soccer contributes to this. Uh, then they have uh, another uh, another aspect called micro concussions, which you get you can get from sports like wrestling, where you're not having full blown concussions all the time, but your head is hitting the mat, your 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 head in, in the in your opponent's head are hitting. Uh, but lots of sports uh, uh, have the this micro concussion aspect to it, and so is all we are trying to do is bring uh more knowledge forward so people are more familiar with with what's happening and in the terms of the doctors believe it or not uh the doctors say you know you know who the child athlete's worst enemy is it's his parents get my son back in the game he don't, he can't be out for two weeks he's got to be back in the game it doesn't and it doesn't matter what sport it is you know it's the yeah. parents that are driving this and so you know as as dads of athletes like you and I are you know, taking a step back, it's tough. To, it's it's tough to do that, but it's the right thing to do. You know, I just saw my son just drove the football down the field Wednesday night. Mm. Several carries and fine, it finalized with with a with a touchdown. You know, he put six on the board for his team, but it took him about five carries to get there, and that was a great great thing as a parent to watch. And I don't, I'm not trying to deny anybody's child's athletic performance we're trying to protect them you know and so we don't know where the where the end game of this goes maybe it's uh uh better protective equipment um but that forward's trying to go because in youth uh that traumatic brain impact uh repeatedly like in sports like football uh before the eighth grade especially for boys is very bad for them and we know this so um, but, uh, yeah, so there's a, there, I, I, there are a lot of things that I want to drive home in this next session. Um, several of them are, are, uh, bipartisan related in that matter. A lot of them are business related, agriculturally related bills as well. Uh, there's just, there's no shortage of things to go, go after here. We have to prioritize them and, uh, really try to single out the things that will make that, the, the the most impact for the most people in the most positive way. Well, let me ask you this question, right? Sure. Because a lot of viewers, you know, hearing kind of what you said about like bills being held back. So it's like, if it's coming across the desk, cause they like, this can be hypothetically the cure for okay. cancer, right? But it has like Republicans name on it. They're going to say, Oh, or they'll just stall it out until it, basically they're not allowing it to be able to get passed. Right. And as the majority, they can do that. So what happens is, sorry, one one more point here. When a bill is held like that in committee, it puts it off the agenda for two years. It can't come back for two more years. No matter how beneficial it might be. No matter how beneficial it is. Right. Like we've had a bill, um, I, I have now, uh, my predecessor had it for two years. It was held. I've put it forward twice, my first term, my second term. So in six years, and this is for, for direct access help for an opioid center in Auburn. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, there's not a single person that lives in Auburn, New York, or the immediate environs of Auburn that would say, oh, we don't need that. Good things for the people. Things are getting held back. Well, of course, we, I guess, what's the solution? You, there needs to be more seats on, our, on the right side of the spectrum to kind of make it a fair playing field. Like, do you feel it's a fair playing field? I mean, it doesn't sound fair to me. I'm just... Well, excited. that's, our, that's our, our democratic system, which we vote. And so I defend that. I believe in it. But right now, I think, I think that, um, you know, the left has used their majority status to go way too far we live in the most dangerous new york we've ever lived in and and you as a police officer i don't have to convince you of this you know when i when i when i hear somebody say that that, that well you know people will sometimes disagree with me on this well i haven't seen this i say well you're a little bit out of touch let me remind you of the of the knife wielding nut that tried to kill lee zeldin last year last august yeah. at a political rally in uh, Rochester where a couple thousand people watched this occur and that guy was out the next day you know what what there's there's so many aspects to the to the the willful destruction of our public safety infrastructure that you know you can't blame police officers 
that are retiring early or quitting or not trying to get into the force. It's uh, interesting times because, like, I'm glad I'm not on the job right now. But, like, as, like, a legacy, like, you know, family and, you know, expectation, my kids probably will most likely as well. But with the current legislation, it's just, it's tough. It's, it's it really is. It's really tough. Yeah. Really and tough. so I, to, to, to directly answer your question, until more Republicans get into office or Democrats actually acknowledge the extent of the damage that they've caused, uh, this doesn't change. Mm-hmm. I, I hear you. I mean, I, I would love in a perfect world that it would be a fair and even playing field where the things aren't being censored or held back or just you know, using it to like, oh, they don't care about certain things or I just wish it was just what it should be for the people. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm glad that you're standing on, you know, on that morality. But uh, going forward, I guess, is there anything that you would maybe want to address on your current campaign that may be like that's not getting attention? Because, like, I, I think from my understanding, my research, that your um, your opposition on the other side you're, that you're running against is uh, very friendly with the media, um, very buddy, buddy to say, nonetheless. Uh, so I don't think you're getting a fair a fair light. So is there anything that you want to maybe just talk while, while I have you here? You know? So, you know, one of the most important things is the fake press is the fake press. And they are out there in force helping the left. How the, the left has been able to co-opt most of the press is uh, is really interesting. That deserves a, another study. But the, the lack of professionalism, the lack of objectivity, and uh, um, the lack of just simple honesty is a huge, huge part of this. And you see it everywhere. You see it everywhere. And, and you know, the left, for example, just... Uh, they published an article in the newspaper. Now, they, they never even talked to me or anybody on my staff. They said, they said Republican um, falsely accuses um, his, uh, his opponent of XYZ. And, like, that's interesting. You know, I looked at the tax records. You know, this is my opponent has a tax warrant out that he hasn't paid. We've got the documents from the court to prove it. And, and so he also, you know, he put out a very, very dishonest, mailer saying he decreased taxes by 14 percent well taxes did decrease but the real payment that people are paying increased through the levy okay so (laughs) so he forgot to mention that fact that the the actual real impact was people are paying more not less and so uh this kind of willful dishonesty is emblematic of someone that should not be in office anywhere, should not have anything to do with our children. I don't want somebody like that around my kids. And and you get into the whole education piece of the parental rights. Uh, this is somebody that, that doesn't think par- parents should have rights over what their children are exposed to in school. And so um, I, there's a lot of things that are very, very wrong and upside down with our society. One of them is the press's willingness to further these uh, goals of the left unfettered, you know, in, a, in, a, in oftentimes a directly dishonest fashion. And so I can't wait. I'm, I'm waiting for the press, you know, tick tock, tick tock. They haven't called me yet. They put this article out and they never even asked me like, hey, why did you put this out? They just yeah. said, no, you're wrong. And I can't wait to show them the documents. Like, yeah, well, I, I hate to tell you, but according to the court system, We've got the documents that show, and and I, I'm betting my opponent is running around like a chicken with his head cut off trying to get that tax warrant satisfied. But it's too late. It's too late. Well, he's raising our taxes as his in his former role uh, as as uh, school board president. While he was raising the taxes of the people in Auburn, you know, he's simultaneously lying about. It. And so, um, when people don't possess basic values like integrity. They have no, um, they shouldn't be around children and they shouldn't be, have anything to do with our government because if you don't have basic integrity and the, it, the desire to do the right thing for the right reason, everything else falls apart. Yes. I mean, power is, uh, can corrupt you. It's like the, like the Lord of the Rings, you know, it's like right. you get this power and it changes you, uh, cause it's, it's endless, you know, it's, uh. You know, I was thinking back when I was like, like law enforcement, for example, you know, having the option of uh, choosing life or death, like you have that authority, you know, that gives, it changes people 
And I've right. seen all the people get affected by it. So it is definitely crucial to have the right people in office. And if their integrity is not there, I mean, let's, let's just keep it to simplicity. Like, I'm like an 80s baby. You know, I'm used to America being a certain way, you know, and integrity was a big thing. You know, like right. my grandfather was very big on like, who are your friends are? You know, are you a good individual? Are you doing the right things? Like yeah. I used to be able to run outside and play until like sundown. You know what I mean? Right. Seven o'clock at night. Easy. You know what I mean? Now I would never let my troops out on a, on alone. Just, yeah, just go, go play the, the sundown. I'm yeah. not doing it. You know, right. a lot, of, a lot of things have changed, but the still the core value, if you distilled everything down to is going to be, if you're already doing shady things in the beginning, I don't. I don't want you to represent me. You're just right. going to do even more shady things if you get in the office. But that's yeah. just my two cents. I'm not an elected official, thank God. <laughs> but I th- my hat to you because you've definitely have been, uh, you know, working hard and, you know, doing great things. And also, I would assume you've been very supportive of, like, veterans in the county yeah. because of your military service. Like, you want to expand on any of those type of things that you got going? Well, um, the biggest thing that we did legislatively is the acknowledgement that that uh, New York State did not have its own veterans administration, and mm-hmm. so um, uh, we that became a thing. It became real a year and a half ago, and that was a huge step in the right direction. And I got to say, so the credit to that initiative that was uh, the that was the idea of Jake Ashby, now Senator Ashby. Mm-hmm. So. Um, but we all got behind him and with him, we made that happen. And, uh, that's going to benefit veterans, uh, in perpetuity in New York state. And, and, and so when people say, well, why might that be important? The reason that's important is because if you look at the concentration of veterans throughout the country, um, states that have poor economies has disproportionately high percentages of veterans because people leave to, to actually, uh, be employed. And so oftentimes when, if, if they serve a long period of time, they do come home and seek second careers, but they initially, uh, leave so they, so that they can, you know, simply find employment. And New York is one of those states that has a disproportionate, um, number of veterans per hundred thousand citizens. So, uh, that's one thing that, that's, uh, that we are all very proud of in our caucus. Uh, and that was bipartisan as well. You know, there, there, you know, some Democrats were behind that too. So, so I, um, want to thank them. Uh, but locally here, we do, uh, several things and the, the acknowledgement in Onondaga County of having the veteran service officer now, that's a huge step in the right direction. And that, uh, right. and that office has done great things, all kinds of things from facilitating honor flights, uh, to, uh, helping people simply with whatever problem they might have navigating the system. And and so the younger somebody is that gets out of the military, say maybe a one or two term person, the more difficulty they have navigating the system, especially the VA healthcare aspect, if they need that, that assistance and that, and that care. And so being part of that infrastructure that, that we're continuing to build on to help them with that, uh, is a, is a huge thing in the right direction as, you know, as well as the, um, veteran service courts, you know, the, um, it, you know, working with veterans that, that end up, uh, unfortunately crossing the line, uh, with crime, uh, oftentimes this is an yeah. intervention that keeps them from going to prison when there are other extenuating circumstances that, um, uh, uh, can help them. So, there's a lot there, there there's a lot more work to do uh for veterans um but uh above all though when you look at it um if we keep losing our population and keep yeah. losing representation you know for example we've lost 13 congressional seats since 1980 and when i say this to a group of democrats they look at me like Shh, we don't talk about that like well you should because it's your policies that are causing this not ours it's your policies that are driving businesses away and driving population away. Look at the states that are gaining population. Florida, Texas, the Carolinas, Virginia, Tennessee. You know, they're not gaining population for no reason. They're gaining population because people have the opportunity for economic prosperity in a safe environment in those places. And that's why, excuse me, that's why they're going there. And, and here we are, 
13 congressional seats less since 1980. That's a ton of federal representation lost. What that means is, to everybody listening, that means a lot less federal money and a lot fewer people to go after it for the rest of us here. And so the nexus between state and federal is, is very strong, and we work together closely and all the time. But, but um, the states that have stronger uh, and more representation, they're going to get a bigger piece of that, and that leaves us languishing. It's crucial. You know, it's not really being talked about. It's, it's important. I mean, really distill it down. It's like, you, the viewer, how does that affect you? That's like, you don't get a D.A.R.E. program because there's no funding. Like, there's right. no money exactly. for, like, the things that will directly impact your life, that make your life better. Like, if you're a business owner or yep. if you're a farmer, you know, agriculture. Um, you know, industry or anything in between tech industry, right. like myself, you know what I mean? Like a lot of those different opportunities oh. are not there. So that is, that's crucial. And thank you for bringing that to everyone's forefront. You're welcome. Uh, uh, one other last couple of things. Um, I do know that you, cause you have the thing about agriculture, you have that background. Is there anything that you have working around like, um, water? I think it's big things that are oh, yeah. on your forefront when it comes to like, upstate new york and like keeping lakes clean but like there's anything that you wanted to like let the viewers back home may not know what you're working yeah. on and what your standpoint is thank you this is a, this is a huge huge issue we have some of the best water in the world and so um for some reason which i can't understand the, the left continually acts as if the, the republican caucus um doesn't care about our resources couldn't be further from the truth and I always use uh, the example with people um, that uh, I got uh, $750,000 more for the lake associations in this year's budget than what they asked for. And so um, that money has to keep flowing. And so resourcing these concerns is something we have to keep doing. And uh, excuse me, it's something that uh, I'm going to continue to work on. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the issues is the algal blooms. The harmful algal blooms as well, HABs they call them. And uh, these are not something that are uh, partisan. For some reason, the left thinks that Republicans don't care about water quality and that uh, um, we haven't done enough to solve this problem. Well, this problem is geologic in the making. It, uh, it, it, it didn't just surface today, last year, and we're not going to fix it next week. Recognition of the problem, studying the problem, resourcing the problem, and then implementing sensible, sensible um, ways to address it are all part of the solution. Which, which I am working very closely with um, the associations to do. I'm on the right committees: the Agriculture Committee, Environmental Conservation Committee, and uh, uh, we're going to keep we're going to keep doing that and keep hammering that. And so um, the 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 press. <laughs> To leave this out for some reason. Again, the fake press seems to leave this out a lot. And uh, um, they act as if that, uh, again, the Republican caucus doesn't care about water quality. Well, hey, hey, guys on the left, let me tell you something. Our our kids and our families drink the water, too. So uh, I hate to tell you, we, ca we care. And we, we care. Uh, we uh, care. Uh, you know, we care. We care more than you, probably, because the funny thing is that I bring up that nobody on the left likes is, when you talk about who the true conservationists are, um, you got to ask, well, how much personal money have you put into conservation? I whip out my hunting license, my fishing license, my bow hunter's license, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and a bunch of other things that I do. Like, where's yours, buddy? Where's yours? Yeah, I got my receipts. Where's yours? That's right. And so, um, you know, that usually results in uh, mouth opening and dropping, eyes getting wide, like, oh, oh yeah. Um, well, we care more. We care more. Like, no, it doesn't work like that. So, so this is an ongoing issue. It needs um, it needs constant attention. And again, in this particular assembly district, there are three finger lakes. These are cherished resources. And so, my answer to this is, we can solve the problems that we have as long as we stop fleecing hardworking, taxpaying New York citizens uh, by diverting their money to illegal aliens. You know, the budget that we that we just passed uh, diverted a ton of money to illegals. And so 
Um, in fact, it was more money than the combined funding for the disabled, the elderly, and veterans. This is unconscionable. This is unconscionable. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so what I mean, do you- I mean I'm, I'm trying to act like this is the first time I'm hearing it, but still, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. It you is. Know, it's, it's absolutely crazy. And, and so the left forgets this. Oh, well, well yeah, well, we don't talk about that. Well, no, you need to talk about it because we're calling your bluff on it. So, there, you know, what this all boils down to is there's real accountability in these jobs. Mm-hmm. And so when you're voting one way and talking out of your mouth the other, no, 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 no. That doesn't work, you know, because guess what? In the balance is our safety, security, economic prosperity, and future. I mean, clearly you care about, you know, District you know, 126. You know what I mean? Like, that's definitely on your forefront. So thank you for doing that and doing what you do. I know it's not easy. Do you have any, like, future visions for, you know, for the district at this point? You know, if you get reelected, you know, what you should be, you know, get reinstated. So, um, of course, but don't forget that this is a different district. So the first district I had was four counties and then redistricting. And we had all of the lawsuits. Um, so the redistricting lawsuits finally ended, uh, um, you know, a year ago, but, uh, so this was, although I'm finishing my second term, it's, it's the first term in this new district. So, so it's still a little new. Um, nonetheless, I was born and raised in Onondaga County. Cayuga County is our neighbor right next door. My district office is in Cayuga County. I've got a satellite office in Onondaga and, uh, um, continuing to, work with uh uh the water quality experts continuing to safeguard uh agriculture and 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 continuing this is a big piece we haven't talked about energy continuing to make sure that uh this thing called the clcpa that the governor is infatuated with the green energy plan that that yeah. dies under its own weight because that's going the one only one aspect of that let's just Forget about the rest of it. Let's just talk about the school bus electrification mandate. That will bankrupt nearly every school district in this. And so what you've seen is nationally, just to remind everyone, is that uh, immediately upon appointment as a Democratic uh, presidential nominee, Kamala Harris has run from the green energy platform completely. And that's all the way down. So now the left is forgetting that they that that they did these things. And I'm going to, you know, I, I did this with the post standard. I want to do it here. I want to quote Bill Magnarelli. You know, I was in a uh, meeting with a, the league of women voters, not, not a very friendly organization to the right, but mm-hmm. Bill, who I respect greatly. He said he was very honest. And he said, we meaning Democrats have to stop scaring people about this. You know, what he was referring to is the retrofit cost for home. You know, you got to make it all electric. It's got to be all renewable. And that retrofit cost is estimated at being thirty to seventy thousand dollars per structure. And the older the house is, the more expensive it is to retrofit. So, so these things, um, they don't make sense. the The CLCPA does not uh, take into account the disciplines of economics, science, math, or physics. And so, when 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 you when you discard those four uh, those four disciplines and try to do something. Then it just becomes a fantasy, and that's what I call it, the fantasy document. And the left knows this; they're running hard away from it because they know that the just again only one aspect. I just to, to, for brevity, just the school bus electrification mandate will drive nearly every school district out of business. And not to mention, you can't use those things in our climate. They don't have the range, and they they the, you know they're extremely dangerous. And they you know another aspect is. Uh, just from a public safety perspective, the typical firefighting gear for our average firefighter right now in, in New York State protects mm-hmm. to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, guess what temperature these these lithium batteries burn at if they catch on fire in a bus or a, or a, or a car? They burn at 2,000 degrees. Yeah, yeah I'm saying they're way above that. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, I mean, there's so many things wrong with the CLCPA that it just, as I said, the left is running hard from it. They're going to they're going to forget that they pushed it so hard for the last four years because they know it doesn't make sense. Everybody is pointing out to them that uh, hey, guess what? It is rather inefficient to try to heat homes with windmills 
and uh, solar power. Solar power in New York State is only 23% efficient. At the end of the day, we can't solve our energy needs in New York without nuclear power. And until they come and recognize that, ironically, my, 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 my opponent said, oh, when he heard me say this, he said, oh, I, yes, I'm a fan of nuclear power. Like, oh, really? That's interesting. Uh, so, um, you know, all kidding aside, we have to have uh, nuclear power as part of the part of the solution here in New York or else it doesn't work. And, and when you look at our heavy industry, you know, which we're going to have in Onondaga County, Micron. Micron yeah. can't have interruptible power, okay? No. Mo- yeah. Most of our industries cannot have interruptible power and be world-class industries. And so as soon as our governor and the left recognizes this, uh, part of this, you know, it will, it will further put this uh, CLCPA to bed. I mean, you know, to be clear, what I'm hearing from you is that it's not that you don't care about these things. It's just your, how do you get to the end goal? That's like, right. Because it sounds like, oh, you guys don't want electric school buses. You just want to kill the environment. It's like, no, because you're putting our firefighters in danger. Like, it's and going to kid. bankrupt your, your local school board. And then, like, then now there's no money to pay the crossing guards. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, it's, you know, it's like this butterfly effect. But then what the magnifying glass is going to be is you guys hate the environment and you're not good but even though you're a farmer you know what i mean you're in agriculture you know what i mean you're in the industry you're like no i let's let's get there but like let's not destroy the house while getting from a to b like let's i use the i use the example mo of uh you know some of the analysis that's been done on the finger lakes water quality Mm -hmm. uh is very pointedly um assessing blame on agriculture and so i use the example like well um look at it this way um there are lots of things that contribute to water quality and if we eliminate our uh food production then we can't eat if we if we reduce if we eliminate practices that make yield profitable then farmers can't compete and they go out of business and then we can't eat because we don't have food production. And so these are the things that people don't, when they're saying, wow, we, we should just, uh, all the nutrient management problems in our lakes are because of agriculture. No, they're not. There, there, there are a thousand things that are contributing to this problem. And so uh, stopping agricultural production, let me tell you something. Uh, you might miss a meal and not care about me as a farmer or the agricultural community. Uh, you miss two meals, you still might not care. You miss three, you're going to start calling my name. You miss four, you're going to be on my doorstep looking for food. So uh, people forget this. We we are very fortunate in this country with our ability to feed ourselves. And and this goes into a thousand different areas where, you know, you'd asked earlier, is there anything you're going to try to do? One of the things I'm going to try to do again is put forward my bill to restrict foreign entities and adversaries from buying our farmland because they're doing yeah. that in other states. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, this, this is, this is a social communist, socialist communist uh, tactic of depriving the people that they want to conquer of their ability to feed themselves. And so I just can't believe, you know, and th- these bills have been introduced federally, thank God. And in many other states where people have recognized this is a real risk. They are trying to to take from us our ability to produce our own food. And so, uh, you know, this perhaps, when you talk about what's most important, this is one of the most important things that we can do. Definitely sounds like you have your, you're well-rounded in your focus. You know, like for me and my kids to play baseball, you know what I mean? Keeping the streets safe to also making sure that, you know, outside threats that I'm not even thinking about. Because like, I just got to get my kids to school. I'm not even thinking about outside entities buying up the farm. So. That's, that's awesome. We're, you were definitely coming to like the end of our, you know, of our show, you know, of our time. But before we go and break, is there anything else that you just wanted to just air out or maybe just didn't bring up or didn't get a chance to? Or, aha, I thought about X, I want to say something. Like, here's your opportunity before we uh, kind of end the show at this point. Thanks. I just want to let everybody know that uh, um, I didn't run for office for any reason other than the ones I stated here. Uh, I am worried about the direction our country and our state is going. When we when when we have a state of affairs where um, our corrections officers, our police officers, our entire law enforcement infrastructure 
is held hostage by the laws that have been created, that means they can't keep us safe. They can't do their job, which which is contributing to all the problems that we have and all the shortages that we have. So, so the biggest thing, government's mo primary role above all else is keeping its people safe. And so before we do anything else, I want everybody to know that that is one of my main focus areas. I'm gonna continue to do that. And uh, as I have for the last four years, and we want New York to be safe again. We want police officers to have dignity, honor, and respect again. We want kids that think they can that, that they can be disrespectful to a police officer to to to, to realize who oh, I shouldn't be doing that, you know. And, and maybe this is too old, but I grew up in a household where uh, my father, if he said it to me once, he said it to me a thousand times. Don't ever let me hear about you being disrespectful to our priest, your professors, or teachers, or the police. Yeah, yeah, it's important. It's definitely important. Well, look, uh, thank you for your insight. You know, I appreciate you being, you know, in season two of the Salt Sea Index. I also want to just take a side note to also thank Momentous Media Group uh, for sponsoring season two of the, this podcast. And I'm grateful that I have such a monumental influencer like yourself on the show. So thank you. You're welcome. It's limit. And um, for the voters back home, just let everyone know like when when the vote and who to vote for. Just your last second, and then we'll end the show. Ladies and gentlemen, I sure hope I've earned your vote in the past, and that I continue to do so. Uh, I have served you honorably, and will continue to do that with your best interests in mind, in the best interests of our state. Uh, again, this is something that uh, is critically important for the future for our children. And I, I want you all to know that uh, that's what's motivating me. So thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone back home. Appreciate it.